Well, again, happy Father's Day. Today we're going to be talking about dirt. Yeah. yeah. What, what dad doesn't like to get into the dirt, right? Okay. All right. Well, anyways, <laughs> you know, I want to welcome you. Welcome those of you that are joining us online. And let's go ahead and open up in a word of prayer. Father, thank you again for all the dads that are represented here. Uh, just ask for your continued guidance and direction. And I ask for your blessings upon them as well. May our hearts be ready to receive from you this morning. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, Amen. Amen. Well, if you have your Bibles, you can turn with me to Genesis chapter 2, verses 7 through 9. Matter of fact, let's do this again. Why don't you stand with me? The verses are going to be up on the screen. I'm going to read the first verse. I'll let you read the second one, and then I'll read the third one, okay? All right, here we go. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And with that being said, you can smile at somebody and have a seat this morning. So God formed man out of the dust of the earth. And dust, I looked that word up in the Hebrew. It's number, if you like this kind of stuff, it's Hebrew number 6083, 6083. Afwar. There you go. That's the Hebrew word. And it means dust. As powdered or gray, hence clay, earth, mud, ashes, dust, earth, ground, mortar, powder, rubbish. <laughs> I just thought that was funny. Rubbish. Dust. It means dust, dirt. And for the purpose of this message this morning, I'll be using the word dust and dirt together. I'm going to tell you this. God can do some amazing things with dirt. It reminds me of one of my favorite movies, UHF. And in the lineup there, Weird Al Yankovic's lineup, one of the, the shows that they were going to do was Fun with Dirt. I thought that was great. Fun with dirt. Anyways, God can do amazing things with dirt. He, with it, he formed man. He rebuked Pharisees, he healed a blind man, and one day soon he'll change our dirt, that is our bodies, into something new. So we're going to start right in with dirt in the garden. Dirt in the garden, that's our first point this morning. On day six of creation, God created man. That's right. And the Lord God named him Adam, and, for our, and our passage this morning tells us the Lord God made man out of the dust of the ground, so the first man was made from dirt. God is so creative that he is able to form man from dirt. He took the dust of the earth and fashioned a man out of it. Not only did he fashion a man, but when God looked at all he created, he said, it was very good. When he got done with all of creation, he said, it is very good. You see, what's interesting is God, as he's creating things, he gets, day with day, day one. He gets through with day one, and he looks around and says, it's good. He gets done with day two. He looks around and says, it is good. Good. He gets done with day three. He looks around and says, it is good. He goes all the way through this until he gets to the very last time. The Lord looks at everything that he created and he says, it is very good. That's right. So obviously it was very good. I like getting very goods so when I do a, a test or whatever and I get back and I hear good job or very good or, or you know, a project that finishes well, very good. I like to hear those. When I get into heaven, I look forward to hearing the Lord say, well done, good and faithful servant, right? I want to hear that you did very good. I hope that you do too. So God created everything. He looked at all he created and said, it's very good. Once God formed man out of the dirt, he then blew his breath into man's nostrils. And the word tells us that man became a living soul. Now, have you ever looked at something and thought, that'll never live? It could be a, a thought or a project. I can't tell you how many projects I've been involved with over the years, from small to huge. Just big projects, little projects. I can tell you that during some of said projects, the thought would hit me, I'm never going to finish this project. This is not happening. I mean, it would get frustrated. I would get frustrated. And, and, and waves of frustration would follow, what, and sometimes self-pity. Have you ever been in a project or something, and you're just like, this is, this is never going to end? I'm not going to get out of this. This is, I mean, and, and then you add having to deal with people on top of that. And, and then you have to deal with maybe parts don't come in for something or something goes awry somewhere. 
But then something on the inside of me triggers. And it's a resistance to failure. A pushback against quitting. A a little lion of encouragement begins to roar. A a flash of the future and seeing that project to completion. You ever had that feeling? I have. Or maybe you're here this morning and you're facing a dream that seems dead. And I'm not talking about selfish dreams, but dreams you know are of God-breathed. Things that you feel in your spirit are supposed to happen. But that dirt's just lying there, not breathing. You know what it looks like and can imagine what it will look like when it's alive, but currently it is just gray dirt. It's just a pile of rubbish. God looked at the dirt in the Garden of Eden, and he blew his breath into Adam. Genesis 2-7, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Men, you are important. Men are on, under extreme attack of the enemy right now. Throughout all the world, not just here in America, in the States, but throughout the whole world, men are under attack. Why? Because men and women are created in the image of God. Listen, this may come as a news flash, but the biblical lineup of men, men are, are called to lead and protect their homes. The culture we live in wants to feminize men. But they're called to lead and protect their homes, not with an iron fist, but rather lead them with godly love, with godly principles. You're called to lead and protect. Did you know that if the man of the house accepts Christ first, the chances of the rest of the family coming to know Jesus, the Savior, goes way up? Men are called to lead. This does not lessen the importance of women. So please don't think, well, Pastor Jason, you just think women are dirt. Well, we're all made of dirt. (laughs) I'm dirt. (laughs) And women aren't any less important. But God has certain roles that he's called men to do. He's called them to lead. But we need to understand why there's such a vicious attack against men, masculinity, and the role of men as fathers, protectors, and providers. God made man first. And truth be told, Adam should have used his authority to cast out the serpent in the garden or from the garden when he was deceiving Eve. And ladies, I know men are not perfect. I am one. I know that some of you have been subjected to horrible men and fathers in your life, but that was not God's design for men. And if you were subject to a lousy man, a rubbish pile of dirt, I'm sorry. However, you need to know that not all men are the same. Now, granted, some of them do act like Satan. You may have been married to him. It may have been your dad, your uncle, your brother, etc. Some, though, act like their father in heaven. And here's what I want you to get. If you have animosity towards men, just because they're men, it's time to repent. If man jokes are your go-to, it may be time to have a look inside and see if you have an offense towards men. Men, the same is true for you concerning your attitude towards women. Satan will do his best to drive wedges between us. We don't want satanic wedgies in our lives. That's funny. (laughs) Satan knows the spiritual principle that a house divided cannot stand. Well, back to dirt in the garden. The father fashioned some of it in the form of man. He breathed into it and Adam came alive. So let's move on to point number two this morning. Dirt on the road. In John chapter 9, verses 1 through 7, if you're taking notes, you can jot this one down. John chapter 9, verses 1 through 7. From the New King James says this, Now as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. 
I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he said these things, he spat on the ground and made clay with the saliva, and he anointed the eyes of the man or the blind man with the clay. Then he said to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated sent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. I love this passage. This is one of my favorite passages. Pastor Jason, you've got a lot of favorites, absolutely, but this is definitely one of my favorites in here. Dude, Jesus spit in the dirt, and he makes mud balls for eyes. Th that's awesome. And I used to wonder why Jesus made clay out of dirt on a road, but then it hit me. That's like the, my son told me the other day, he said, I wondered why the ball was getting larger and larger, and then it hit me. So this, <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. Why did Jesus use dirt to make the guy's eyes? Why did he do this? Well, it hit me. Jesus does what the fa he sees the Father doing or has seen the Father do. And guess what Jesus saw the Father do at the creation of man? He made eyeballs out of dirt. And I'd imagine God probably did the same thing. <laughs> made the eyes, made for, for Adam. I think that's pretty epic. I truly believe that Jesus saw the Father make Adam's eyes out of dirt. Jesus followed the Father's example. Need some eyes? Step number one, find some dirt. Chef's note, one half cuff is enough for one set of eyes. Step number two, spit in dirt. Step number three, thoroughly knead, spit in the dirt. And step number four, this is very important, place mud on the place, or place mud on the place where you want new eyes. And step number five, have the recipient wash off mud. For what is needed, he has already been attached, grafted, healed, and made whole. The rest of the dirt can be washed off and used for someone else. There you go. I think that's awesome. Men, you may feel like you've made a mess of your life and are worthless dirt. Jesus wants to heal your dirt to glorify the Father in heaven. Jesus wants to put his hands on your dirt so that you can be made whole. Jesus wants to use your dirt for his glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus sees where you're at. He is willing to reach down into your dirty life road, spit on your road, anoint you with mud, and make you hold. We just need to believe that he can and that he is willing. You see, the problem most of the church has today is that, oh, yeah, I believe Jesus can do it. But they don't believe he's willing. Can I tell you something that Jesus came to heal? Jesus came to set the captive free. If you are bound by something, Jesus wants to set you free. If you need healing in your life, Jesus wants to heal you. It's not a question of whether he's willing. He answered that question. He answered it with the lepers. The one leper came up to Jesus and said, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. You see, he knew Jesus could make him clean. A lot of us don't have any, we don't have any doubt that Jesus can heal. Our doubt is, will he heal? Jesus answered the, the leper. He said, I am willing. Well, do you know that, that God shows no favorites? He's willing. If your dirt's messed up, if you're messed up here, if you're broken, you need wholeness and healing, Jesus is willing to heal your dirt. I'm so glad he's willing. He can and he will. Oh, yes. There is something we have to do, and we really need to do, and that is to follow him in obedience. Jesus healed a man one time, a lame man. A dude was sitting down by the, the pool, and uh, the, the, this pool in Jerusalem. At times, an angel would come and stir the water in the pool. The first person to get down to the pool would be healed. Well, he was lame. He had a hard time getting to the pool. Jesus comes up and sees this man. He says, do you want to be healed? He says, he says sir, I said, I try. But I see the pool getting stirred. By the time I get down to it, somebody else jumps in ahead of me. You know, there was a guy with a splinter last week. He jumped in, splinter's gone. Another guy, he had a hard time seeing out of one eye. He jumped in when the pool was stirred and he was healed. You know, by the time I get down there, buddy, I mean, I plop in and... The angel's gone, water's been stirred, somebody else done took the healing. That's the JMB version. Jesus lays hands on him and heals him. 
But what Jesus tells him is something interesting. He says, go and sin no more, lest something worse come upon you. I was like, ouch. I really think that worst part was hell. But, I mean, hopefully the guy took it to heart. The woman who caught, was caught in the act of adultery, I think we mentioned her last week. What did Jesus tell her? Go and sin no more. Some people have a hard time with that. Well, that's not very loving. It's what Jesus said. <laughs> You're meddling now, I know. Dirt on the road. Jesus can and he will. Let's move on. Point number three this morning. Dirt in the temple. <laughs> oh, glory. Another one of my favorite passages. John chapter 8, verses 1 through 11. If you have your Bibles, feel free to turn there. If not, you can just listen. John chapter 8, verses... Did I say 1 through 11? I sure did. I'm going to start in verse 2. Because <laughs> that's what I have in my notes. <laughs> now, early in the morning, when... That's right. Jesus came again into the temple, and all the people came to see him, and he sat down and taught them. Then this, so where are they at? Let's, let's break this down real quick. Where are they at? They are at the, the temple, right? So they're in church. They, they have in church, and Jesus is teaching. Then the scribes and the Pharisees made, uh, brought to him a woman caught in adultery, and when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what do you say? And they, they said this, this they said, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear. I can see Jesus doing this. So he, he's, just, he's just like, yep. He starts. He don't even look up at him. He just starts writing. Anybody here ever played in the dirt? You may have ever made roads in the sand that led to nowhere? Yeah. Well, Jesus starts writing some stuff out. So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. And again, he stooped down and rolled on the ground. So he, he stops. He just says, All right, you without sin can cast the first stone. And then he goes right back down to what he was doing. And he starts writing again. We're going to talk about this in just a minute. I want you to get the visual here. And those who heard it, being convicted by their conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest even to the last. And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. And Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman. He said to her, woman, where are those accusers of yours? Where did everybody go? Has no one condemned you? She said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, neither do I. Go and sin no more. This passage fascinates me. They brought in the woman who was caught in the very act. Where was the man? Uh, ladies, am I right? If you look, they, 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 she was obviously not alone. <laughs> so it makes me wonder if it was a double trap. One to catch the woman and one to try and stump Jesus to see if they could catch him in something. So the Pharisees came in and they interrupted Jesus' sermon. They set the accused in the center of the congregation. And they treated her like dirt. Now before you get too excited and think, I would never treat someone like that. How are you treating those that have been caught in sin? Are you condemning them? Speaking evil of them? Rejoicing that they have fallen? Or are you praying for them? Forgiving those that have wronged you? Proverbs 27, I'm sorry, 24, 17 tells us this. Do not rejoice when your enemy falls and do not let your heart be glad when he stumbles. There's a command right there. The Pharisees wanted Jesus to execute judgment right there on the spot. She's done being caught. We caught her red-handed. Kill her. Well, am I glad that the Lord does not operate that way. And none of us be alive that that were the case. I know that's improper English, but let's move on. Jesus' response. 
He stooped down and started writing in the dirt. Now, the Bible does not tell us what he was writing in the dirt. We don't know. There are commentaries, you know, those places where they write things about the Bible, commentaries, and thoughts as to what he may have written. It's possible that he started writing down secret sins of those present, starting with the oldest. Thoughts of coveting the neighbor's wife, uh, white lies told in secret, or, or names of mistresses. You know, he might have been writing Sally Smith so that, you know, Pharisee Frank could see it, or, or Mary Morgan, or, you know, whatever. We don't really know what Jesus wrote in the dirt. But it sure did have a big impact on those who were standing around and on his numbers that day. You see, normally a pastor likes to see a lot of people in service, but apparently Jesus hadn't read the, uh, the Purpose Driven Church yet. By Rick Warren. When Jesus was done riding in the dirt, he'd done run off all the congregation. Every last one of them. All but one. And she was the one that needed his message the most. The message, since there's no one here to condemn you, neither will I. But wait, there's more. Act now and you'll hear the rest of this sermon, what Jesus said. Jesus finished up with, go and sin no more. So we can't live in hyper grace. We can't live in legalism. There is a road that we need to travel. We've been forgiven, but we don't have an excuse to to live in sin. We have to be living for the glory of the Lord. The beauty is, is that the Lord gives us the strength to do so, which is pretty epic. So go and sin no more. Point number four this morning, dirt no more. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 50 through 54 Word tells us this. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. What's he going to tell us? A mystery. That's right. We shall not all sleep. Now that word sleep means die. Okay, We shall not all die. We shall not all sleep. But we shall all be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible. And we shall be changed for this corruptible must put on incorruption. And this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. That's shouting news right there. Hallelujah. One of our 16 fundamental truths in the assemblies of God is the blessed hope. This is the rapture of the church. Those that have died in Christ will rise from the dead at the trumpet sound. And those that are alive in Christ will be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. I'd love to be near a graveyard when that trumpet sounds. I think that would be pretty epic. Boom, 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 seeing graves fly open, knowing that I'm next. Hallelujah. Glory. I heard one guy say, if I'm standing around some heathen, grab hold of them. And that way, when we get up high enough in the air, I say, now, do you want me to let go? Or are you ready to accept Christ now? <laughs> no, I, just, I think that's rotten, but it's funny at the same time. <laughs> How high do you go before you let go? <laughs> I don't know. but <laughs> I would imagine you get high enough, everybody becomes a Christian then. <laughs> but this old dirt suit will be changed from something that was headed towards death into something that will never die. It will be dirt no more, but a glorious body. Hallelujah. And Jesus gave us an idea of what this will be like. You see, when Christ rose from the dead, he was seen by the disciples. So in other words, when you get your new body, you will be seen by others. Hallelujah. You aren't just some transparent ghost that strums on, uh, sits on clouds and strums a harp. That is not my idea of heaven. Jesus gave us an idea of what we can look forward to. He had a body. Amen. He was seen by the disciples. And get this, they recognized him. He said, well, pastor, what about on the road to, to Emmaus where, where those, those two guys, they were talking with Jesus. Jesus purposely hid himself from them. But then when he broke bread, their eyes were opened and they were like, whoa, that was Jesus. Or as we, I would probably say, dude, that was Jesus. <laughs> They knew it was Jesus. They recognized Jesus when Jesus showed up. The the doors were locked. The disciples were were hiding in the upper room in fear. The doors were locked and shut. Jesus just appears, right? And the disciples were like, whoa. And Jesus said, don't be afraid. I'm not a ghost. I have flesh and bones, right? 
Those are Jesus' words. So obviously our new bodies, we have flesh and bones, will recognize one another. This is biblical principles here, okay? Bible teaching 101. And, and so we see this in the Word of God. We, we see what God has designed for us. We'll recognize one another. We'll, we'll see one another, which is awesome. Uh, he, he was in bodily form. We, we will be seen. We will recognize. We're going to look a whole lot better, though. Amen. My knee won't hurt. Amen. You may have other ailments or whatever. It, but I, I'm looking forward to that new body. <laughs> Jesus has substance and can be touched and can touch. We will have new bodies that can touch and be touched. He ate with the disciples. One of my favorite things that I learned about Jesus when he rose from the dead. What did he tell the disciples? He's like, listen, you got any food? Right? A man after my own heart. I know you can't tell, but I like to eat. And I'm sure many of you do the same. And that means in heaven there's going to be food. We know this as a truth because the Lord said those that are saved will join him at the marriage supper. That says it all to me right there of the Lamb. Behold, I go and prepare a place for you. Amen. There is a place at the table for them that believe at the marriage supper of the Lamb. That means we're going to eat. And I, it's going to be awesome. I don't know if they've got barbecue in heaven or fried chicken. I don't know what God has planned, but it's going to be good. I just know that. It would make your tongue come out and slap your brain, as my dad would say. So he ate with the disciples. We will eat with the Lord Jesus at the marriage supper of the Lamb. And we will have fellowship with one another. I can't wait to invite you all over to my mansion in heaven for a glorious meal together. Amen. There are many more things that are in store for them that believe. So look, I guess the question is, do you believe this morning? And if you don't, today is a great day of salvation. Hallelujah. Let's conclude this. God has done amazing things with dirt. Are you willing to give him yours? Are you willing to give him your dirt? You see, in order for the Lord to transform our dirt, we have to be willing vessels. You know, God loves you so much that he's not going to force you to go to heaven. I heard it put this way. I thought it was an amazing illustration. I heard it this past week. This guy put it this way. He said, ladies, and I'm going to ask you ladies here, have you ever had a guy pursue you that you were like, <laughs> nope? I mean, they professed their love towards you. They were like, I love you. I want to spend the rest of my life with you. And you're like, there's, no, there's not enough money in this planet for me to marry you or even go out on a date with you. They may even bought you roses and flowers and, and, and even gifts, and they're trying to win you over, but you're like, no. Sorry, Jack, you are not for me. How would you feel if he forced you to marry him and come live with him? Would you have a love for him? Would you want to be there? You wouldn't, would you? You see, God loves every person on this planet, but he is not going to force anybody into a relationship with him. He's not going to force you to go to heaven. He's not going to force you to accept his promises. But you got to realize that if you reject God, if you reject his love, if you reject his wooing, the only thing that's left is everything without him. Listen, this is the reality of hell. In hell, there's no water because God is the living water. In hell, there's no air because God is the breath of life. In hell, there's no, no light because God is light. In hell, there's no love. People that think that, well, I'm just going to go to hell and join my, my family members that I know went there so I can love on them and we can have a party together. There's no love because love comes from God. That is a gift of God. And if you reject him here, you won't receive hell there. God is wooing. He's calling people to himself. He's calling people to Jesus Christ because he wants you 
and I to have his best. He wants us to go to heaven. He wants us to have those things. He is wooing people. He's been, he, may, you, he may have been calling you even this morning. Those of you listening online, you may have been feeling his pull this morning. Please do not ignore that call. Please don't. Because if you don't want God, if you reject him and his ways, then the only thing that's left is everything without him. And it's a horrible experience. God is the one who gives us life. He's the one that gives us breath. He's the one that gives us sight, hearing, sound, touch, taste, smell. All of that is not, those things are are horrible in, in hell. But in heaven, they're wonderful. God gave his only son for us. Jesus died for us while we were yet sinners. He made a way into heaven for this dirt. You see, this, this dirt suit is going to pass away one day. I recognize that. I see it getting older in the mirror. I see my gray hair coming in in the sides. You may not be able to tell very well because I've got gel in my hair, but when I don't have gel, buddy, I am starting to look really white. My hair. I know I'm <laughs> Anyways, so... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Pastor, you are. You need a tan, buddy. <laughs> I'm so glad that God didn't make everybody look like me. I love seeing diversity. I do. I love seeing different shades of skin. My, my darker brothers and sister, my, my sisters, my, my lighter brothers and sisters. I mean, I just love seeing different shades, how God made us all differently in that, those shades. I think it's awesome. I really do. But this earth suit, and, and you may recognize in yourself. Now, if you're young, you, you may have the thought, I'm going to live forever. You're right. You will live forever, but you ain't going to look like this but, you know, but for so many years. Trust me, I know. <laughs> I've seen it. It's happened in my own life. But this earth suit will pass away. But the beauty of being saved is the fact that I'm getting a new body, one that will never grow old one that doesn't hurt, one that doesn't get tired, and it'll get fed at the marriage supper. It'll get fed throughout eternity. Hallelujah. Glory. I'm excited about it. I hope you are too. God won't force you to serve him. You see, he loves you so much that he allows free will. God wants you to be willing to give your all to him. He wants to heal, deliver, and set free. Men, the Father in heaven wants to guide you in every area of your life. Now, I know this, this applies to ladies too, but it's Father's Day. So the question is, men, will you let him? Will you, will you do this? Be spirit-led? Will you allow the Lord to make new eyes for you if you need them? Some of you may be used to looking at things you shouldn't look at. Or putting things into your body you shouldn't be putting in. Or doing things that you shouldn't be doing. Will you let the Lord make your dirt new? To set you free? Will you allow the Lord to write in the dirt to get your attention? It may be that your conscience is seared. Maybe it's time to ask the Lord, is my conscience seared? Is there something in my life that needs to change? And will you choose to follow Jesus so that your dirt suit will be changed to immortality at the trumpet sound? I guess those are questions we need to ask ourselves this morning. Are we willing? The Father's willing to take us in. I'm going to tell you something right now. You've done nothing to stop the Father from loving you. You say, well, I've got a really bad past. Okay. Jesus came to die for those that have really bad pasts as well. You may think you're a good person. Jesus died for you too. He died for us all. From the best of sinners to the worst of sinners, we're all covered under the blood. And that's good news. Stand with me, please. I would like for all the men to join me at the front. And families, if you're here, would you please uh, surround men? I'm going to pray over the guys today. Church, if you just want to come and surround the men too. Hey, guys. Good to have my family here. Dad, happy Father's Day.
Love you. Sure, come on up. Okay, I can do that too. <laughs> Love you guys. Well, let's pray. Well, Father God, I thank you for all of the men here this morning and for those that are joining us online. Please use our dirt. Heal us in the areas that we need healing. Correct us in the areas that we need correction. Would you guide us towards the prize of redeeming this dirt suit through Jesus Christ, your son? Lord, we commit our lives to your will today. We ask that you would use us for your glory. I thank you for healing those that need healing. I thank you for drawing those that need Jesus unto him. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. 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 Happy Father's Day. I love you guys. Enjoy the rest of your day. Men, there's a gift for you as you're leaving this morning. You're dismissed. Love you too. Thank you.